Hi, we're going to continue with Jorge Castillo Juan. We're happy to have him here. Um, where Jorge studied medicine at the Autonomous University of Yucatan. He holds a master in clinical neuroscience from UCL. And he also holds a PhD in genetics, neuroscience, and bio biogerontology from UCL. And currently, Jorge is a Max Planck Society Research Associate at the UCL Institute of Healthy Aging. Thank you, Jorge, for being here. Okay, so I'm going to switch things a little bit. Uh, so by a show of hands, uh, how many of you would like to live to 100 years? Okay, well, that's interesting. Only three people didn't raise their hands to live to 100 years. So of, this, of, of, of the three of you who didn't raise uh, your hands, uh, do you don't want to live to 100 years because you think you're going to be like with these capacities or disabled or not be uh, healthy? Uh, if, if yes, please raise your hand. Okay, so to the two of you who answered yes, that you think you won't be in, in, in great health, if I would tell you that there is possibility of you living to 100 years, but being in the health that you are right now, would you want to live to 100 years? <laughs> okay, two yeses. Okay, great. So let's see if that's possible. So let's talk about aging now. Okay, so the first, the first thing is uh, the questions that I want to answer with you guys. So the first question is, of course, what is aging? Uh, is there a biology to the aging process? And uh, how do we study the aging process? And of course, can, we, uh, be, can aging be cured? So the first question, the first question uh, is, is anyone a chemist here? OK. So I'm giving you the photo of a very famous chemist. He's uh, Irish, British. And I have a clue there for the Royal Society, of course, uh, for Great Britain. So, who is this guy? Niels Bohr? Niels Bohr? No, not Niels Bohr. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Say it? No, 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 I don't know. No, say it, say it. No. It sounded right, so that's why I'm asking. No, it doesn't have to do with aging. It's a chemist. It's a chemist. So this guy is Robert Boyle. And Robert Boyle is a very famous chemist because he did the Boyle law that has to do with gas and temperature and all of these things. And he's considered uh, the, one of the modern fathers of chemistry. But one of the important things that Robert Boyle did is that he was one of the founders of the Royal Society. And when he was founding, when he was uh, inaugurating the, the Royal Society, he actually did a to-do list. And I haven't edited this, this uh, to-do list that he made, and this is the order in which he made them. So, Rafael, would you be able to read the first line? The prolongation of life. The prolongation of life. And Citlali, would you be able to read the second line just before the comma? There the recovery of you. So these are the things that Robert Boyle said that with scientific advancement we will be able to achieve. The prolongation of life and the recovery of you. And this is very interesting because even though, uh, even though we haven't done anything to actually intervene in the aging process, life expectancy has been increasing over time at a very steady pace. And I'm just showing you here three examples of three different <laughs> countries. Great Britain, who for example in 2011 have a life expectancy of 80 years. Mexico, who in 2011 had increased in uh, a life expectancy of 76. And Japan, who was the record holder of the longest lived population, had a life expectancy of 82, uh, 82 plus uh, years. And what you can see uh, very immediately is that there are predictions of the 2,100 years, and none of them seem to cap. So life, life expectancy is expected to continue to increase uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, and this is just, uh, just a, a kind of a geographical distribution of life, life expectancy in 2010 for different countries in Latin America. And uh, it's, it's a very homogeneous uh, number for most of Latin American countries. So what has contributed for this uh, population aging? So two phenomena have contributed for this uh, population aging, mostly in developed nations, of course. First of all, the rate of birth has reduced in most developed countries. We are having uh, new births in, in a less rate, so less newborns. 
and of course the improvements in material fetal medicine and public health measures like vaccines. So mostly all of these predictions have only accounted for these public health measures. And there's another one that, uh, that, that uh, is not here yet, which is, for example, the control of chronic degenerative diseases. So we can control patients with stroke, with diabetes, with cardiovascular disease, etc. How does Mexico situate in the world of aging? So for example, here I'm situating uh, predictions for, for 2050 in Mexico. You can see that almost one in every four Mexicans will be in the group of age of above 60. So this, of course, has serious uh, public health, uh, um, requires public health attention for these uh, patients or these people that are being, gonna be uh, over the age of 60. And this is another prediction uh, from one of my <coughs> professors at, at uh, the University of Yucatan, who said that almost uh, the same thing. By 2050, we're gonna have almost one in every four Mexicans uh, uh, above the age of, of 60. So a, as an initiative, uh, our, one of our national institutes of aging uh, uh, generated the Instituto Nacional de Geriatria, or the National Institute of Geriatrics, to study all of these uh, uh, new developments that need to be, that need to be made uh, nowadays. And some predictions are a bit, some people call them wacky, but it might happen. So uh, Kristen Senetal said that uh, there's, a very, there's, there's an increased likelihood of people celebrating their 100th birthday if they actually were born in countries with low-lived residents by the year 2000. So we are expecting to have a lot, a lot of these centenarians uh, in, in the future. We already have them. And do we have them in Mexico? Um, so first, I'm going to show you the longest-lived person in the world. The longest-lived person in the world is Jean-Luc Calmant. She lived 122 years with 164 days. And there are very interesting facts about Jacques Lamont because she wasn't unhealthy. She started fencing lessons at the age of 85 years. She lived on her own until she was 110. She smoked cigarettes from the age of 21 until she was 117 and decided, I've had enough. <laughs> so when people ask her, what do you think is this secret for your long life? She's attributed her, her longevity to different things, and uh, not necessarily they explain it. For example, a diet rich in olive oil, which she actually rubbed on her skin as well. She drank a glass of port with certain regularity, and she ate one kilogram of chocolate every week. That sounds fantastic. So I'm not advocating for anyone to go and eat chocolates, one kilogram of chocolate every week, nor a smoke until they're 117, most likely people get to 117. Uh, but the most important thing that she said is to make honor to her, to her last name, to keep calm as, as come on means. So in Mexico, I, I try to follow the, uh, the newspapers that say that we actually have this area. <laughs> and I hear put uh, Doña Leandra Becerra Lumbreras who supposedly 127 years, this was a year ago, and Jesus Castillo Rangel, uh, that is originally from Campeche, now living in Quintana Roo, in my, in my municipality, was said to be 118 years. However, it's very difficult to really prove that they are their ages. In Mexico, we don't keep proper records of a lot of things. Uh, one of them being kind of birth control, of course. Um, so, Trying to define aging, I'm, I'm going to give you this very, very complicated explanation. So aging can be defined as a progressive decline in tissue and organism function, and the ability to respond to stress that occurs in association with homeostatic failure and the accumulation of molecular damage. If anyone understood this, you basically can have a PhD. In aging <laughs> so basically what aging is, is the functional decline of our tissues or organs. And that comes associated with as well the accumulation of molecular damage. It means our cells are not healthy anymore. And because they're not healthy anymore, we cannot cope with stress. And this stress can be in forms of, for example, flu or a vaccine or any, any kind of stress, not necessarily psychological stress of I have an exam tomorrow, for example, but cellular stress. So, um, so then the question is, why study aging? Is it really relevant? And then can it be studied from a biomedical perspective? And there are three reasons that I, I, I want to tell you why this is relevant and, and answering all of these questions. And, and as I said, although a small group of people uh, get to the age of 100 or even above 100, 
uh, with only minor uh, health problems, if any. This is unfortunately not the case for the majority of the population. And aging is in fact the biggest risk factor uh, for uh, age-related diseases, of course. For example, here I'm showing you that as aging increases, and these are statistics from the UK and Europe, you see an increase in the incidence of cardiovascular disease, a prevalence of dementia, and as well a prevalence of cancer, for example. And hence we have that aging is this, the single most important common risk factor for all of these diseases that we call aging. This has made uh, a certain group of, of, of biogerontologists, of people that study aging, to think that we should actually uh, start thinking of disease in a different way. So currently, we have therapeutic interventions that are targeted for specific diseases. So we have therapies for neurodegeneration, therapies for cancer, therapies for diabetes, etc., etc. However, if we think that all of these diseases have this uh, risk factor as aging being a, a risk factor, we should probably start thinking that we should tackle the aging process, and then we might have a pro benefit, probably not even having these diseases or only being manifested very, very late in life. Because the objective, of course, is healthy aging, is to be able to get to a very old age and be capable of moving, of thinking, of enjoying life in general. Then a second reason is that aging is very complex. Uh, most of us have experienced aging, not, uh, not ourselves yet. However, uh, we can see we have grandparents and we see older people and we see that different organs and different tissues deteriorate with different rates and as well with different diseases. So at some point this discourages a lot of people thinking maybe aging is just, it's just random. There's nothing that we can do about it. But this is not true, uh, as we'll see later. And then the other, the other very important thing about aging is aging is almost universal. And I emphasize the almost here. And even if you had a pet, like a cat or a dog, you've seen those pets age. So similar things happen to them. They actually develop diseases as we do. They develop cancer, for example. Or if you lived in a harm with chickens and donkeys, you've seen them age as well. And, and because of that, we actually know a little bit about aging ourselves. Everyone knows a little bit about it. You don't have to do a PhD in biogerontology to be able to, to know a little bit about aging. So I'm going to show you here uh, the longevity. I, I want you to actually tell me the longevity of different species that I'm showing you here. Next one. And I'm showing you here the ages. So you're going to tell me. So just the first one. You can just click for the first yeah. one. So the first one I already told you. The top one is Jacques Lamont. So she lived up to 122 years. So, what do you give me for the elephant? 86? 86. 86 and 190. 86. 86. 86. Okay, the mouse? Four years. Four years, correct. The turtle? 190. Okay. And the last one? Immortal. Immortal. Really? And we say that this, there's, there's a sea anemones and little creatures. In, in, the, in the sometimes in, in salty water and sometimes in, in, in not salty water, and we say that these uh, these organisms are immortal because when you take them out of their environment and you actually culture them in the laboratory and you culture them over a long period of time, you do not see that their that their cells are actually uh, accumulating damage or they cannot uh, or they cannot divide <coughs> or their fertility rate doesn't decline, their movement doesn't decline, so they are considered in a way. So they will only be killed by external hazard if you kill them. Next one. So how do we study aging? Because aging is universal then, we can actually take these organisms that we don't think as very related to us, and we can study aging in them. So for example, the first one, anyone here drinks beer? <laughs> if you didn't raise your hand, you're lying, I know. <laughs> so uh, this, is, uh, this is yeast. So this is brewing yeast, for example. And we don't think that it's related to us in any way, shape, or form. And this is a unicellular organism. We are multicellular, have many different kinds of cells. This is one cell. Okay? And it shares 16% of our DNA with us. It's very interesting. We're 16% similar to yeast that makes beer. Kind of interesting. <laughs> then we take a multicellular organism like the brown worm, kind of Dictis elegans. It's a very important worm, and we'll see why uh, in the following slides. And we share 
40% of our DNA with this worm. This is incredible. This thing is one millimeter. And we share 40% of our DNA with it. And then we have the fruit fly, which is my model organism. And we share 60% of our DNA with the fruit fly. And I know you are very intelligent people. And no, if you put a fly and a worm together, they do not make a human, even though that makes a <laughs> And then we have uh, the, more, uh, the more complex organisms, like mammals, like the mouse or the monkeys. And of course, they share uh, more similarity with us. However, there are some peculiarities about these organisms that make them very attractive to study aging. To study aging, you have to be able to study the entire lifespan of an organism. And for example, the round world is three weeks. So you can have tons of experiments in a PhD in three or four years, for example. If you go to the more complex fly that has very organized tissues, it has a brain, it has a heart, it has ovaries, it has an intestine, it has many, many, many things that are similar to us. This leaves three months, for example. So that's why you can have a lot of experiments and you can study aging in very much detail. And one of the things that is very interesting, especially about these two model organisms, is that you can actually modify their genes and you can find out what genes are important uh, to, uh, for the aging process? So there are two questions that people think, OK, so you cannot have an anti-aging intervention. You cannot tackle the aging process if you haven't understood aging, per se. Who thinks that that's the truth? You need to fully understand a process before you actually intervene in it. Anyone thinks, yeah, that's true? One person. One and a half. <laughs> <laughs> So no, if that was the case, we wouldn't be able to do anything with our brains because we don't understand the brain and we do a lot of things with, with, with brain, for example. So the same thing happens with the aging. We don't need to fully understand it to be able to intervene in it. And then the other question, which is the most important question, will we ever be able to slow down the aging process? So fortunately, people start wondering if and is there a biological principle for aging actually started doing the experiments. And the first person who actually showed that there's a biology of aging was a researcher called Mike Glass. And in 1988, stopped thinking ifs and is theirs, and actually did an experiment. He actually treated some worms, these worms that I told you about before. And then he did a mutagenesis screen. Basically, he gave them a drug that would uh, make, make mutants in the DNA of these organisms. And then he found that some of those organisms actually live longer. And then a group of scientists, including Cynthia Kenyon, who probably will win a Nobel Prize one day, uh, <coughs> showed that a specific mutation in a gene could actually double the lifespan of this organism. So this is the, these are the control animals, and this is the mutant. And this was very interesting. This happened in 1993, when everything was clean by back then. And then my boss up here, literally, no, I'm, not, I'm not referring to the sky, just up. <laughs> a few floors above us. Um, uh, they show that actually a similar gene acting in a similar uh, in a similar pathway actually could extend the lifespan of, of flies as well. So here are the control flies, and he's a heterozygous mutant, meaning that only 50% of that piece of DNA was lost, or 100% of the, that piece of DNA was lost, and you get a lifespan extension. And people were thinking this probably is just something weird that's happening to either worms or flies, until someone at Harvard actually did the experiment. And they found that even in, in, in mouse, so these are the control animals, when you mutate a similar gene, these animals can live longer. So, but living longer is something that is happening right now. We are seeing increase in life expectancy, and that, this, that doesn't mean that the population is growing all healthier. So, does this mean that these interventions have some positive effects? And I'm showing you basically the experiment a similar experiment to the one that they did in 2001 upstairs. And here I can, you can see that this is some of my data. And the control flies and the mutant flies, the mutant flies live longer. And here I'm just showing you one parameter of healthiness. And this parameter of healthiness might be very relevant for us. So this average performance, performance index is scoring the ability of the flies to move. And you can see that whilst all of the control flies are basically immobile, almost 50% of the mutant flies are still moving uh, a lot. And basically, when these guys are all dead, these are still moving uh, a considerable amount. So this means that the long-lived animals that we've generated in the laboratory are not only living longer, they're also living healthier for longer. 
And this has been proved in, in, in mouse models that are more related to us. And you can see that when you mutate these animals that they live longer, you prevent the onset, so you prevent that they get diseases like cataracts, like diabetes, Alzheimer's, systemic inflammation, cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, broad range of preventative medicine just here. So this is very interesting because then you can say, I can find genes that are important in these three model organisms. They get lifespan extension. Probably they have delayed functional decline or even prevention or amelioration of pathology, meaning diseases, and hence they are living healthier for longer. They have healthy aging. So of course, um, what do I do with this? So this is my model organism, and sometimes I do feel like this. I look in the mirror and I think, am I that similar to the fly? And the answer, as I told you before, is we share 60% of our DNAs, and as, and as well is 70% of the, of the uh, uh, disease known genes, meaning genes that cause disease, are also shared in the fly. So what do I do with the fly? <coughs> Taking this uh, great similarity that exists between Drosophila and humans, identifying genes that actually improve health during aging, and then trying to find drugs that target those genes so that we can get the benefits of the genetic intervention without having to do anything to the genes of people, because we will not be able to create mutants. This is not excellent. So we need drugs that would actually do the job instead of genetic interventions. And this has been part of my PhD, uh, trying to characterize different drugs and uh, was part of my PhD, and trying to characterize different drugs and how they actually modify health during aging. And I'm not going to really show you any results, but there are drugs that actually do this job. And the way we are going about it is identifying it in these model organisms, trying to identify what is different in them, how they respond to these drugs, and then trying to characterize different panel of things to then try to see if these drugs in these model organisms that are not so much related to us can do the same thing in, in organisms that are more related to us, like the mouse. Um, and the good news is that there are already drugs that are approved for human use. Uh, that we've been testing in the laboratory, that actually these drugs that all people are already taking actually have prolongated benefits. And one of them is metformin, which is the drug, what is the drug that is mostly used for the treatment of diabetes. This has very, very uh, strong uh, uh, prolongated effects in, 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 in worms, for example, and it can extend lifespan in mice. Uh, ibuprofen has been shown recently in, in, uh, in a study that can extend the lifespan of yeast worms and flies. Rapamycin, which was the first drug, has been able to show to extend lifespan in mouse, even when the treatment is starting extremely late that you would think there's no way this is gonna have benefit. So thinking in human terms, like if you start treatment when you're 60, you still get health and lifespan benefits. And aspirin, even the very humble aspirin, has some beneficial effects for health and aging. So there is hope. So with this, I want to conclude that although aging is not a disease, aging is the biggest risk factor for disability and disease. And most countries will face serious socioeconomic consequences due to our aging population. So we need to do something about it. And because we know there is a biology of aging, we can actually intervene in this biology of aging. We should be finding drugs that can slow down this aging process and probably eliminate the onset of diseases and drugs that are already proved for human use, which are some of the drugs that I'm studying, are actually shown the way. So with that, I would like to thank you. Actually, this uh, was our last Christmas party, which and the photo was shot in this exact room. <laughs> and this is mostly, uh, most of the Institute of Healthy Aging. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jorge, for your time. Uh, any questions?